a man, one of, the, one of my mentors when I was a younger man said this. Uh, he said, we live on the suburbs of blasphemy when we pray for so little and expect so little from a great God. And so we should know the surpassing greatness of his power. We should be mighty and you can lift weights. More important is that it be spiritual power. Welcome to the Basic Training Podcast, led by Dr. Robert Forney. In this series, we'll be discussing the topic of manhood in today's society. Andrew? Yes. Pastor, would you uh, pray? Yes. Okay. Our Father, we thank you for the time that you've given us this evening to Mm -hmm. study your word, to um, examine ourselves, Father, and to see and see where we are lacking in our manhood, mm-hmm. lacking in masculinity, lacking in our calling to uh, walk in a manner worthy of Jesus mm-hmm. Christ. Our Father, we pray that you would bless this time of teaching, mm-hmm. that you would give Bob special insight mm-hmm. into your word, a, 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 an ability to communicate even over uh, electronic means. Mm-hmm. And f- that this would be a blessing to all of us who are involved. Lord, I pray mm-hmm. that I pray that there would be a buy-in into this and that mm-hmm. we would see this kind of attendance in the following weeks. Mm-hmm. And, and we, would, uh, we would commit to the long haul and mm-hmm. uh, see that this is, uh, this is paying off and is an investment that we can make that will... Uh, run throughout our lives mm-hmm. and be paying off mm-hmm. through our lives. Lord, help us. Mm-hmm. We are weak. We are sinful mm-hmm. and uh, desire to glorify you and desire to walk in a mm-hmm. manner worthy of your Savior. So mm-hmm. use us to that end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. So um, I've my wife and I have had a Bible study in our home for many years. Uh, it it started in 1979, and Daniel, do you remember, did we stop in 14 or? I think it was 14. 14, so between 1979 and 2014. And we would have groups from 50 to over 100, and it became uh, obvious um, that we needed some, uh, some leadership, especially among uh, the guys. And so I started playing around with a curriculum uh, to train guys uh, to, to lead. And, um, and we ran that for many years. And, uh, and as the years went by, I added to the curriculum. It's basically all Bible-based. It's scripture, but it's, it's uniquely about men and the role that, that God wants us to play. Uh, when we started the, the church that Andrew attended, that we attended together, Christ the Word, um, we, uh, I got together uh, the men at that time. There were about 30, 32 guys uh, the first week that the church started. <clears throat> and uh, they were here in our home, and I asked each of the guys to, to introduce themselves, as you just did, and then I said, and tell us about your father. Well, I was shocked. Uh, I think Pastor David, our, our pastor, was also shocked because there were only two of us that had anything nice to say about our fathers. Um, Fathers were absent, they were distant, uh, they weren't Christians. In some cases, they abandoned the family, and uh, it was amazing. And so we, being a new church, we needed officers in the church, and we quickly decided that we needed to come up with a training program for those who would become deacons and, and ultimately become elders. You know, the, the scripture says, you know, to be an officer, you got to manage your own household well. And if these guys had not really seen that. And now these, they were good guys, but it's amazing. Um, I'm 73. We've been married 32 years. And when I was growing up, you know, in the, in the 40s and the 50s, I mean, I remember the 1940s and 50s, and it was different. Society was different. Men were men. Uh, even non-Christians were more manly. Today, a lot of the guys think if they got a pickup truck, that makes them a man. You know, or if they lift weights in a gym, that that makes them a man. 
But sadly, if you want to find a group of homosexuals, go to a gym. <laughs> and so, you know, character, godly, Christ-honoring character, there's nothing wrong with lifting weights or driving a truck, but that doesn't make you a godly man. And so uh, that's what we, we've done. So we started this thing, and I called, I named it Basic Training. And um, David and I taught it for the first uh, few years. And so that's really what I'd like to do. And, and we've been anxious to get this on a podcast. And so we're recording this. Uh, you need to know that. And, and hopefully we'll be able to get the, the podcast uh, certified and, uh, and, and make it available. Um, so you know that gender uh, manhood is in crisis in our culture. And I would say to you, from what I know about um, Pastor Andrew and, and uh, Pastor Michael, uh, you know, if there's a church that doesn't need this, it's probably your church. You know, if there's another church that doesn't need it, it's probably my church, Christ the Word. Uh, because we get it. We know that, that the cultural idea about what is a man is wrong. You know, and even in a lot of the church, sadly, the idea of manhood is disappearing. And, you know, the Boy Scouts, a lot of scoutmasters are women now. In a, lot of, in a lot of churches, if women weren't doing things, you know, little would get done. And in families, you know, guys uh, often get frustrated with their wives, their wives get frustrated with them, and so on. So I, what I really believe is we got to start with us. That is, with, with your church, with Trinity, with Christ the Word, with Clear Note in Bloomington and, and other churches of our ilk that, that understand that, you know, in the 60s, the attack was on the Word of God and, and evolution. Today, it's really on gender. And, um, and so I, I just, just in the mail uh, a couple days ago, I got this uh, magazine. This is Costco. Can you read it? And it says, it says grit, right? And it says, Angela Duckworth examines the intersection of passion and perseverance. Well, <laughs> you know, women are now the ones who are the symbols of grit. <laughs> and I think our women ought to have grit. I'm not opposed to that. But I don't know that they should be the poster children for grit. <laughs> You know, I think that, you know, uh, being able to do hard things and persevere is something that ought to be characteristic of a Christian man. And so that's what we're up against. And I really believe this is a great opportunity to grow your church. That I think that, that guys in, in your community and in America are hungry to be shown how to be men. Uh, I, I've talked to many people who, who didn't want to come to Christ because they thought they had to choose between being a real man or being a Christian, that they thought Christians were somehow wussy and that they didn't want to become wussy. Well, that is absolutely false. I mean, if there was ever a real man, it was Jesus Christ. If there was ever a man who had grit, you know, and persevered and responsibility and wisdom, you know, and prudence and fortitude and and charity and, and all the things that should characterize real manhood, you know, it was him. And it's sad that our culture th thinks more about uh, the abuse of women when they think about Christian men uh, today or the, or the abuse of boys, you know, than they do, um, than they do as it is. So what, what, is, what do we want to accomplish? Well, I want to give you some, uh, some tools to use in your ministries, you know, starting with your own life, but in your families, but also in your church and in your community. And it's, it's really my prayer and my desire that you will re reproduce all of this. In other words, don't you know, take, take them into one of the reasons I'm going to give you handouts every week is I want you to take and use this material, modify it, you know, add your own wisdom, you know, about it. Uh, and as we, as we go through this, I hope you'll feel free to discuss, that you'll ask questions if you say, wait a minute, I don't get that or I don't agree with that or whatever. I want this to be a real, um, you know, men used to get together and they'd have things called smokers. 
Now, I'm a toxicologist, and I'm not in favor of men getting together having smokers, but the idea was, the idea was that it was kind of the women go in the other room, you know, we've got some men talk. <laughs> we've got, we got to have a conversation together. We've got things that we're dealing with, and we want to, you know, we want to do that. I think that doesn't happen anymore. You know, in Toledo, even the barbers are mostly women. You know, it used to be you could at least go to a barber shop, you know, and there'd be men there. Uh, men barbers and so forth. So that, so I want I want to pass this uh, my lifetime of studying this and teaching this on to you that you will. Uh, and please, you don't have to quote me. Quote scripture. <laughs> don't don't quote me. And um, and I hope uh, it's my prayer that we can see a revival in the Church of Jesus Christ, as the men in the church as we become closer to the image of Jesus that he's intended for us. Okay, I'd like to start with, um, I hope, if you didn't bring your Bibles, I hope you would bring your Bibles. Uh, there will be handouts at the end of the evening, and uh, the handouts will have the scripture. But as Andrew and I talked, we thought it would be better if you, uh, if you were not looking at the answers that I have in the handouts but we're rather, we were considering the scripture together. And I'd like to start with, with a prayer that the Apostle Paul prays for the church at Ephesus. And uh, he prays it not because they were not godly, but because they were. And, and I think it's a, it would be a good place for us to start. He says in the first chapter of Ephesians, I'm reading from Ephesians 1, and I'm, I'm using the New American Standard uh, version. You can use whatever version you see fit. He says, For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, which exists among you, and your love for all the saints. So he heard that they loved all the saints and that they had faith. They were exhibiting faith. So these are Christians, and they're, they're not just Christians, they're good Christians. Um, he says, I do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you. And here is his prayer, and I want it to be our prayer for ourselves and for each other. Paul prays for these good Christian men to, that they may have a spirit of wisdom and of the revelation of the knowledge of him. Wisdom and revelation of the knowledge of Jesus. So every week, as we look at different aspects of manhood, we're going to be looking at different aspects, basically, of Jesus, even though much of this will not be in the Gospels. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know three things. There are three things. And these, think of this. These are men like you. These are not rookies. They have grown to the point where they, they have strong faith. They're exhibiting that. They're being persecuted and so forth. And they have love for all the saints. You know, and a lot of times that is not evident in us, and it should be. That the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know, one, what is the hope of his calling? Two, what are the riches of his inheritance in the saints? And three, what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? These are in the accordance of the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead. So three things, hope, riches, power. A real man has hope. And that means we don't get discouraged. That means we're not negative. It means we provide optimism and comfort to our families, right? Because Why? Because we have hope in his calling, that he who has called us is greater than the world, that he who is in us is greater than that which is in the world, that we have a precious place in heaven, and the Holy Spirit, and the scriptures, and each other. And so a real man should be a man full of hope. I pray 
with Paul, and I want you to pray for each other that we may know the hope of the calling of Jesus Christ. And then the second thing, what are the riches of his inheritance in the saints? That there are no paupers in the kingdom. That there are riches, real riches. And I don't mean that the gospel is prosperous and that you're all going to be driving Cadillacs next week. But the, the riches that he has from the Holy Spirit and in the kingdom and in the kingdom to come far exceed anything that you can possibly imagine. So many men are crippled by a pursuit of financial security. And we should be concerned. We do have struggles. You know, since the fall, the, the earth doesn't yield up its uh, crops. You know, but we have a Savior, and we have uh, the, his Holy Spirit to help us. And the third one, the, the greatness of his power. And I might say that it's the greatness of his power that gives us hope and helps us to understand the riches of his inheritance. That's why I, I urge you, if you haven't, begin praying for great things. Um, a man, one of, the, one of my mentors when I was a younger man, said this. Uh, he said, we live on the suburbs of blasphemy when we pray for so little and expect so little from a great God. And so we should know the surpassing greatness of his power. We should be mighty, and you can lift weights, but it, it ought to, more important is that it be spiritual power. Okay, so this is, this is a prayer. And as, as we go through this, periodically I want to present to us, to me and to you, prayers of great saints, uh, some in scripture and some from biographies and, and other places. Okay, so tonight we want to start this by uh, considering um, the creation. So we're going we're gonna to spend the rest of our time in Genesis 2 and 3. And um, if, if you have scripture, uh, please open it. Now, for recording purposes, uh, forgive me, I'm going to read the text because the, the way this recording is being made is here in Toledo, and I think uh, we don't have to worry about the sound quality. Okay, so um, I'm going to start in um, uh, Genesis chapter 2, and I'm going to start uh, at verse 7. Now, you know, in Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth, and the earth was out form and void, and darkness on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering, brooding over the surface of the waters, and God said there will be light, so forth. So we have the whole creation story in one, but in two... It's recapitulated. It's not different, but the, the emphasis in chapter 2 is on the creation of Adam and Eve. And so it begins in verse 7. It says, this is the account, of, I'm sorry, verse 7. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a, a living being. So he, he formed us from the dust, we weren't created what's called ex nihilo, out of nothing. He created light out of nothing. He created the heavens and the earth out of nothing, ex nihilo, by fiat, by speaking it. But with, with, but with Adam, he created Adam from the ground. And this is important, as we'll see in a minute, because Eve was created not from the ground, but from Adam. And this is a significant distinction. Okay, so, um, and he breathed, he breathed into the nostrils of Adam, and Adam became a living being, and the word being really means a soul. He breathed into Adam a living soul. And um, then the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon. It flows around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. The bdellium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gion. It flows around the whole land of Cush. 
The name of the third is Tigris. It flows east of Assyria, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. The Lord God commanded man, commanded man. This is the first command. He created man, he created this garden, he created the gold and the rivers and all these things, put man there, now he commands man, and he says, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will die, die. It's translated surely die, but in Hebrew it's actually die, die. It's the way you intensify. Uh, then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every bird of the sky, and brought them to the man to see what he, the man, would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. This is very significant. We'll comment on that in just a minute. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to the beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on the man. He slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. Do you see the repetition? He took of the dust and formed it into Adam. He took of Adam's rib and fashioned it into a woman, and then he brought the animals to Adam to name. Then he brought the woman to Adam, and Adam names her. This shows headship. As we're going to go through, this is before the fall. Listen, before the fall. Patriarchy, male headship, is not a matter of sin. It's a matter of design. And the design is that we might be image bearers of the Lord Jesus Christ and illustrate in a great drama the relationship between Christ and the church and our wives play the role of the church and we are to love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. and this is clear in creation as as we'll speak of in just a minute so the man said he, he names her so the man said this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason. For what reason? <laughs> because of God's created order. Because God created the woman from the man. Because God brought the woman to the man. Because the woman was named by the man. You know, women today are the ones doing all the naming. What's the deal with that? Where did that come from? What's the deal with women wanting to take their father's names and hyphenate? You know, it's really interesting. They don't take their mother's names. You know, and, and actually their father's name was the name of their father's fathers, 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 fathers right? So there's maybe a hundred men whose name they prefer and they don't want to take their husband's name. Well, this is rebellion. The naming, your wife having your name, is illustrative of the creative order and the headship that God will judge us all by. See, to be head doesn't mean that you're a good head or a bad head. It just means you're a head. You know, uh, Elizabeth Elliot, a woman, said, doesn't the human body itself teach us this? That a man's body is all about acting on and a woman's body is all about being acted upon, right? 
A woman has a womb that receives. A man has a penis that penetrates and gives, right? It's the way God created us. And the, even in the church, the culture is asking us to be ashamed of this, to, to say that you know, this male privilege is unrighteous. Well, actually, it is a privilege, but it's a privilege to be a woman as well. What's not good, you know, a turtle glorifies God by being a turtle, right? And yet we have all these men that want to act like women and all these women who dress and behave as though they were men. And that is got to stop in the church. It's, it really is an abomination, and it's, and it's spoken of that. So, so how do we find this? So, so for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother. It doesn't say, therefore, the couple shall get together and decide on what kind of wedding that they'd like to have. It says the man leaves to be joined to his wife, and they become one flesh. Leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and they shall become what? one flesh. And the man and his wife were naked and were not ashamed. And so this is, uh, this, is this created order. And so uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says this, I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. See, we have a head too. The head of the wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Right? Jesus said, my will is to do the will of him who sent me. All right? He submitted to the Father in everything. His head is God the Father. Our head is Jesus Christ. And if we don't do what our head, Jesus Christ, commands us, then we're in rebellion. You know, and when we, when we expect women to be men or we tolerate it, it's a, it's a big problem. Okay, so we look in the uh, created order and we see that uh, in, further in 1 Corinthians 11, it says that the reason why man is the head is, for man did not come from woman, but woman from man. So how is headship? Adam was created first. Eve was created for Adam. Adam was not created for Eve. Now in marriage, we're one flesh. I don't, I, I don't mean that we're above. In Christ, there's neither male or female. This is not about preeminence, but it is about role. No man is given the role of bearing children, you know, of being pregnant and giving birth and suckling at our breast. This is not man's role. So why should it be woman's role to do that which only men can do? And sadly, men, we have abdicated. Throughout our culture, at leading in the church, uh, men have just said, yes, dear, uh, you know, rather than to look to Christ and to say, how should we do this? We should not do it harshly. We're not talking about yelling. We're not talking about being nasty. We're talking about loving but loving in a leading way. Um, woman was created for man. She was created from man. She was brought to the man and named by the man. This is headship, 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 headship. Uh, and it's up to us to, uh, to appreciate this. Now, I want to look at the fall and how the fall affects this whole relationship. And so I'm now going to read in chapter 3, starting at um, verse 4. <clears throat> the serpent comes to the woman. Listen, guys. The serpent came to the woman. He didn't come to the man. He came to the woman. There are so many homes that end up in disarray because of temptations of women who are not being protected by their husbands. I'm not saying that we're better than them. What I'm saying is, if we understand our role as head, 
Jesus roll his head, he protected the disciples. He protected them from Satan. He protected them from, from Rome and from the palace guard, right? It was, it was his role as head. He continues to protect us, and he intends that we protect our families and our wives. Anyway, the serpent comes to him. He, he said to the woman, you, shall, you surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, referring to the, the forbidden fruit, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, you know. When we first were married, uh, my wife used to listen to uh, women in gatherings. They gathered together and they'd all complain about their husbands. You know, one, one woman would say, he did? Well, let me tell you what my husband did. You know, and they just uh, enjoy their superiority in their righteousness as they put down their husbands, right? And of course, their husbands, in many cases, deserved whatever criticism that they were sharing, but the wives deserved some criticism as well, right? And that was not being spoken of, uh, and therefore, uh, it's the man who's in the doghouse. And all of a sudden, the whole created order is sort of twisted. So, um, this is the woman. She listens to the serpent. Now listen in the next verse, verse 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, the tree was desirable to make one wise. Not God. You know, Paul's prayer that our, our hearts might be enlightened, that we might receive wisdom from God and the revelation of him, of who he is, and the hope of his calling. You know, this woman thinks his calling is no good, right? That the, the tree is, offers more hope and riches than does uh, the Lord God. And uh, she sees this, and that it was a delight to the eyes. She sees that something is good, even though God has said it's not good, and it's a delight to her eye. How many things in culture now are a delight to people's eyes? And they look at it and they judge and they say, well, this is not, this is not bad. Look how good it looks, right? Well, this is, this is where it begins. You know, you men, you know, how much of your life is formed on what you desire, even though that desire may be against what God has said is good. And what we're really saying is, along with Eve, we're saying, you know, hey, I know what it takes to be wise. And so that it was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate and gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. So she sees, she evaluates, it's a delight to the eyes, it's good for making one wise, and so she took and, and ate it and gave it to her husband. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed, sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. In other words, they covered their sex. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, that is, God said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Now notice that God, although he knew about the serpent, he knew about the woman, he comes to Adam first. Do you understand that? You understand that we are accountable first. And Adam, of course, he says, man says, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. So Adam blames his wife. No. No. Is there wrong in Eve? Yes, there is wrong in Eve. But Adam is talk is God is talking to Adam about Adam's role. 
and Adam's role has been abdicated. Instead of leaving, leading and protecting his wife, he's following his wife and responding to her. She's initiating, he's responding. It's supposed to be the other way around. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So she passes the buck on down to the serpent. Well, they're both true. <laughs> the woman did give it to Adam. The serpent did tempt the woman. They're not, they're not lying at this point, but they're not accepting responsibility. So then the Lord God says to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, the dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And of course, the serpent's seed is satanic power and the woman's seed, it's singular, in the New Testament, were pointed out, Paul tells us, seed is singular, not seeds, and that's Jesus. So separation between Jesus, the seed of the woman, and notice it's the seed of the woman rather than the seed of man. And Mary was a virgin when she conceived Jesus, so Jesus is that seed. And it says, he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain, you will bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband. And that's, it's unmitigated desire for husbands that is driving fem feminism. And they're not restrained. There's nothing in culture restraining them. And, and many of us don't know how to do this, how to, how to lead in a way that honors God and loves our wives, and that's what this whole, what I want this whole thing to be about, is, is basically looking at and saying, what is scripture? How does God instruct us as to how we can do this in a way that honors him and is a joy to our wives and endears them to us and, and is a loving leadership, a servant leadership? Anyway, so, um, and he will rule over you. In other words, it's, now it's not going to be a loving headship. It's going to be an autocracy, you know, and very often that they, the women's movement started calling it male chauvinist pig, you know, a, a, a man who, who demands of a wife, rules, barks at her, expects things, but doesn't love her, doesn't protect her, doesn't provide for her, but, uh, but simply uh, barks. And that's not godly manhood. Uh, then to Adam he said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat. And it's interesting, he, God didn't command the woman, he commanded the man. The woman got the message, which she told to the serpent. And to Adam he said, because you've listened to this voice, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles shall grow for you, and he will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Okay, so if we look at this, I want to say here's here's problem in in marriage. And it's, uh, there's several things. Look at what the fall did first to vision. What happened to their sight? It says their eyes were opened. Now they could see. They could see the trees. Adam saw the animals they brought to him and he names them. You know, he saw an Eve, naked Eve, being brought to him by God. You know, wow, thank you. You know, he saw that. But their eyes are opened, and now they see they're naked. So what's, what's that? What do, you, what do we call that? It's called shame. Shame. And how do we respond to shame? They sow fig leaves. What does it mean to sow fig leaves? They hide. So ever since, men and women are hiding from each other. 
and they're either feeling shame or they're afflicting it on each other. You dirty old man. Right? And all of a sudden, something beautiful, the human body, sex, intercourse, children, gets shot through with shame and hiding. <clears throat> Hearing, they heard the sound of God walking. What does it say? When they heard the sound of God walking, what? They were afraid. So first we have shame. Now we have guilt. And what did they do? They hid in the bushes. One of my teachers used to say, as a matter of emphasis, and you'll probably hear me say it a lot, uh, if you're willing to come back and continue with us, uh, there's no extra charge for what I'm about to tell you. Um, in other words, you know, star this. Hiding is just the death of marriage. And yet it's very common. And shame and guilt are very often involved. And sometimes it's shame and guilt that we feel and sometimes it's that which we afflict on each other. And this does not glorify God. This was not his purpose. This is not what he wants. And so a loving husband who loves his wife needs to lead her out of hiding. Okay, there's no extra charge for this. I urge you, you'll hear me say this many times. Romance your wives. Go after them. Talk to them. Listen to them. We tend to hide. How was your day? Fine. What'd you do? Nothing. Same old thing. And meanwhile, we're not asking our wives about their days. And we'll talk about this more. This, this year is divided into four sections. If you look at the syllabus, the first couple of months are principles, and then we're going to go into fatherhood, and then fatherhood will end with courtship going into marriage, and then marriage, and then at the end we're going to talk about leadership. Those are the four, those are the four sections. And when we get to... Uh, marriage, to being a husband, um, I just urge you to listen to your wives, and I want to tell you something. If you're like me, and I think you probably are, when our wives start telling us stories, we want to get to the end. We want the punchline. You know, our wife starts telling us about how um, one of our kids got hurt. And we want to know, well, is he all right? This is not what women want. <laughs> no, do you know, no, this is key. I, we'll, I'll talk about this more, being a father and being a husband. But you, if this is really, you can take this to the bank. What your, mother, what your wife wants and what will help her to stop hiding is to know you care. And the way she will know that you care is if you relive the whole story, starting from what she was doing before this event happened to then how she found out about the event. And as she tells this story, if you cultivate this in her, her emotions will rise and fall. She's startled, then she's afraid, then she's worried, then she's anxious, then she's acting, and she wants you to go through each one of those feelings with her. She wants to relive that and have you relive each emotion and say, oh, wow, that must have really been a problem. And when she says that you are sensitive, when she sense that you empathize with her, 
she'll stop hiding. Huh? And when she stops hiding, all right, now we're beginning to deal with shame and guilt. Right? And I want to tell you, for a woman, it's one of the sexiest things that you can do. So I purposed in my marriage to date my wife. Around the house, there are so many distractions. And that for me to really be able to listen to her, we needed to get out of the house. And when we were young married, we didn't have as much cash as God has now blessed us with. And so these were fairly cheap dates, but they were dates. And the idea of the date was not to go to a, a sports bar where it's so loud you can't hear each other talk and where you're more interested in the game than you are in your wife. Instead, we go someplace, typically a restaurant, where I can sit and look into her eyes and talk. And she not only does she want me to go through her day like that, she wants me to talk to her in the same way, not just about what happened, but about what I was feeling. This is why women love Facebook. They do this to each other, you know, and they end up forming all these bonds. And meanwhile, you know, as men, we appear distant to them. And so because of the fall, there's hiding. Because of the fall, our work is hard. Their work is hard. And there's all this stress and frustration. And what the gospel brings to us is released from all of this. Forgiveness, but power. Great power. Do you know that you have such authority to pray for your wife and your children? Do you know that? Do you understand that? Because you're the head. And the head is given this access. How do I know? Is it I just invent this? Jesus tells men that we're to be careful how we live with our wives, that our prayers are not hindered. Becoming a godly man is the path to the unsurpassing greatness of his power. And, you know, Paul in Ephesians, he measures that power by the resurrection. And I want to tell you, I have seen men who thought their marriages had grown cold, who following these scriptural principles that we're going to, we're going to talk about this year, have seen their marriages catch fire and come back to life greater than they were when they got married. And I say the best of you, the ones of you that have the best marriages, that we can all improve our marriages and therefore glorify God more by loving our wives as Christ loved the church, you know, and protecting her from Satan, from her own fears and anxieties. Women are full of fears and anxieties, and they respond to that by taking control. And when a woman responds to her fears and anxieties by taking control, most of the time it's because the man is not in control and has not been providing this for her. I am real excited about this. Um, this pretty much ends the material. Before I tell you what we're going to do next week, uh, is there any discussion or any questions? You've all been sort of just listening to me drool on here. I really appreciate you guys, and I want you to know I fail, have failed, do fail, will fail. You know, if I could just leave you with one other tidbit. It's tempting to think that a starting point is like here at the bottom, and then we go up in a straight line and we have success. This is not life. This is life. We have a starting point and the arrow does this before we get to success. 
that's what we have here in the fall. You know, the ground doesn't yield. It's hard work. There's sweat. Women are bearing pain in childbirth, and their desire is for to be men, and you know, and all this, all these struggles. And there's and sin besets us, and there's all this stuff. But we got to be courageous. We got to persevere. We got to keep coming back to our head and receiving from Him the strength that we need to be the loving husbands and fathers that he's calling us to be. And boy, I want to tell you, you can turn Spartanburg upside down by doing this. If your wives are glowing because of the extent of your love, it's so unusual today that people will go, wow, what is it with you? You know, what's going on? You say, well, come to our church, you know. Amen. Hey Bob, yes. Uh, can you tell these men what you do for uh, a living? And um, yes, yes, so I should have. Happens. I should have said that. <clears throat> I am a toxicologist. Uh, my, I've been on the faculty of a medical school, teaching toxicology and uh, treating um, people mostly in the ER. I don't actually lay my hands on them, but I work with emergency physicians treating drug overdoses and other kinds of poisonings. I also work in a coroner's office where I'm responsible for determining the cause and manner of death as it relates to drugs. In the last five or six years, you may have noticed we have an opiate crisis. There are an enlarged number of people dying from an opiate overdose. A lot of it is fentanyl or something related to fentanyl today. It started out as being Percocet, and then it became heroin, and then fentanyl, and now it's going on to more potent things. But what I want to tell you is, in, in 12 years in Vietnam, there were approximately 59,000 young American men your age that were killed in 12 years. Last year... In the United States, there were 64,000 mostly men. 75, 80% were men. 80, 85% were white. And the average age is close to 29. Men in their 20s and 30s are becoming addicts. And now we have a new crisis, a marijuana crisis. Four years ago, I would maybe deal with four or five people a week who were under the influence of marijuana, whether it was the emergency room or death. Now it's in the hundreds. America has decided that marijuana is not only safe, but it's actually a miracle drug, and it is neither safe nor a miracle drug. And so one of the things that's been driving me about this is, what's going on with men? It seems like manhood is just disappearing. You know, these guys, if you look at them, they have flat panel screens, they have video games, you know, and they're into pornography. It's like their lives are fantasy rather than reality. You know, and I think a lot of it is we don't have women that are looking to us the way women did when I was young. When I was young, if you were interested in sex, you had one option, and that was marriage. And if you wanted a pretty wife, you better have a good job, right? Because you're competing. <laughs> now, this is, this is secular thinking. I understand that God brings our wives to us and, and all of that, but all I'm saying is now, you know, men are just wusses. Women are the sexual aggressors, and men retreat into fantasy land. You know, and in, in a lot of homes, you know, if it were not for the woman working, the, the home would collapse. You know, and I understand a lot of women have to work, but I'm just saying this is all the attack on, man, on manhood. And I think, you know, we have the gospel. 
We have the power of the Holy Spirit. We have the unsurpassing, you know, he says that you may know the unsurpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe. Well, why wouldn't everybody know that surpassing greatness of his power? Because they're not testing it. <laughs> they're not getting in line. They're not saying, Lord, you know, they're not like David saying, let's take down Goliath. <laughs> you know, I come in the name of the, uh, you know, that, that courage is not foolish courage. It's that David, as a young man, understand, understood the surpassing greatness of his power. And it was much greater than what appeared in Goliath. You know, and, and therefore, am I saying that, that there's no suffering? No, I'm not saying that. Yeah, there's Job. We have troubles. There's storms. The disciples are roaring across the Sea of Galilee and storms come up and they're scared to death and they're not making any progress. And Jesus is praying for them. And then finally he walks to them on the water. And they go, well, what's that, Lord? What, what's with the storm? Could it be that he wants us to know the surpassing greatness of his power towards us? That he wanted the disciples to know that he has power over the wind and the waves? You know, and that God is not calling us into a life that doesn't have hard work and frustration and failure and setback and worries, but we should know the hope of his calling and the riches of his inheritance. And I think there are men out there, you know, as I, I'm asked, I'm invited all over the country to speak about this opiate thing. I'm going to be in Boston in a couple of weeks. And one of the things I've told Andrew is I want to continue to do this even when I travel, but it'll depend on the quality of Wi-Fi I can get in, in whatever hotel I'm staying at. You know, and I want to tell you that the world doesn't get it. They don't understand that these men are lost. They're poor souls. They're looking for something, and they think they're finding it in a drug. But, you know, it's really the Lord Jesus Christ and the power that he offers us that's about that. So thank you. Any other questions? If I could follow up, this is Chuck. Yes. Something you said early on struck me when you, you mentioned, remember in the 40s and the 50s when masculinity was a lot more common for men were men, even if they weren't godly men. Yes. And if man was defined by the protection and defense, then how did we get where we are today? How did the men of the past give up on you know the centrality of the then give up the inheritance we had today? That's a great question, and I've got an answer because I lived through it. <laughs> you know, it was in the 60s. And uh, women in the 60s, they were burning their bras. You know, and I can tell you that my fellow college students, the guys, we looked at that and sort of smirked and said, well, I'm all about that. Because now all of a sudden you saw their breasts flopping underneath their shirts and you could see their nipples st sticking out. And they go, well, this is great, right? And then they decided to, that we ought to make love and not war. Right? And again, the guys are going, yeah, well, okay. Now, I'm not, I was a Christian. I don't want to be misunderstood at this point. But the guys just bought right into it. They said, yeah, we don't want commitment. You know, you want to work? <laughs> Great. You know, take something off my back. You mean I get to have sex and I don't have to get, I don't have to be married? You mean I don't have to support? You mean you don't want to have kids? You mean you want to have birth control? So we don't have kids. Great. That means I have more money to spend on, on me, on trucks and sports and, and things. And so the guys just, you know, jumped right in. And, of course, it's because they didn't, they didn't have a biblical idea. Now, I did. My father was, you know, a godly man, and he was a lover of my mother and my grandfather and my great-grandfather. And when you come from that kind of heritage... We're going to discuss this next week, but you know that the sins of the fathers are visited on the children to the fourth generation. And I believe it was in the 60s that everything turned south. Now, people, church historians will tell you that the 60s happened because of what happened before the 60s. You know, it was when evolution was taking over and the word of God was being challenged that it wasn't really inspired and, you know, and all of that. 
Um, but ultimately, it was that abdication that, uh, that happened. When I went to medical school, they used to, they used to criticize women who applied because they said, you know, why should you take the spot of a man who will work as a physician his entire life, you know, when you're just going to get married and stop practicing? You know, and there were, you know, out of a class of a couple of hundred, there were maybe two women in the, in the class. Now, if you look in graduate schools, in law school, in medical school, a majority of the students are women. If you look at the graduating class from college last year, a majority are women. If you look at management positions in the United States, a majority are women. You know, and, you, and what are men doing? You know, they're doing fantasy football or something. You know, they're living for something that's not real. Why are all the movies about comic books? You know, why, why isn't there real drama about real men doing real manly things? You know, and so that's the slide. That's the, and it's because that's what sells. That's what the culture wants, and so that's what Hollywood produces, and that's where we are. But I really think, and it's one of the, th one of the reasons why I'm so arrogant to think that I might be able to offer something is I'm 73, and I have this perspective of what used to be. I'll tell you one last story. I was, um, I was taking a, a post out of the ground with my dad. It was summertime. We both had our shirts off. Um, I had on a pair of uh, jeans. And um, it was warm, and Dad had, we had a big uh, sledgehammer. And Dad stood on one side of the post, and I stood on the other. And he would lift the, the sledge up over his head and swing it down. We dug around the post first, and he'd knock it to one side. Then he'd hand me the sledgehammer, and I'd pick it up, and I'd hit it from the other direction. And we were passing back, and we were just shooting the breeze, father-son stuff. And... Um, then Dad swung, and he missed, and it hit my knee. And immediately, a rosette of blood began to blossom in my jeans. And Dad looked at me, and he says, oh, he says, well, I'm sorry. He says, are you all right? And I sort of took a couple of steps back and forth, putting weight on it, and I said, yeah, I, I think so. And Dad handed me the sledge. Now, today, you know... <laughs> Call 911, you know, um, probably the, the mother comes out, what are you doing with my boy? Why are you? Leave him alone, you brute. You know, and you didn't have to be a Christian back, that, back then to have a chest. In the, in the beginning of the handout, I have this famous quote from C.S. Lewis. We make men without chests and expect of them virtue and enterprise. We laugh at honor and are shocked to find traitors in our midst. We castrate and bid the geldings be fruitful. That the gelding is the one who's been castrated, right? And so, you know, the root, the, the root of the word virtue comes from the Latin virtus, which is a derivative of ver, which means man. To be virtuous always meant to be manly. And to be manly meant to have character qualities. Uh, among the top are charity, or love, prudence, wisdom, fortitude, courage, temperance, self-control, and thrift, being good stewards, right? And that's what's that's what's manly, is to, to have those, those characteristics. And of course, they're evident. For example, fortitude is evident when we face opposition. Right? So whether the opposition is a wife who's angry, justly or unjustly, you know, well, fortitude leads anyway, even though it may be humiliated. Maybe you've just been humiliated by your wife in public. You know, prudence gives you wisdom so that the action you take is not unwise, right? And so when you combine all these virtues, biblical virtues, into a package, then wives learn to trust us and learn, really feel that we love them. I pontificate a lot. I'm sorry about that. I've, I've appreci I just really appreciate this. 
I hope, I hope you will find value uh, in these scriptures and that you will, you will consider them. Take the, take the handouts home and uh, look at them and, and maybe find someone to talk about some of these concepts with. You know, maybe in the workplace or maybe in your family or, or what may discuss with your wife. You know, what do you think about this, honey? Okay. Can we have someone close in prayer? I, you know, it's 913. I, I really only wanted to take an hour, but this is our first time. We'll try to, we'll try to keep her uh, short. I, you may want to have some time to, to discuss matters uh, there uh, before you go home. Can I ask Mike, Mike maybe to pray or... Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> Father, we thank you that you have not left us without your word and that your spirit works through your word. We thank you for the time that we spent studying how you made us and how we've fallen in the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you would strengthen us to be godly men, men of virtue, men of strength, that uh, live for your kingdom and take good care of those you steward to us. Father, we pray that you bless Bob uh, as he prepares. And we thank you for his uh, service to us. And we ask that this would bear much fruit. In your son's mm -hmm. name, amen. amen. Okay, next week, I want to look at the covenant. The covenant is a contract that God has with us, and we have privilege because of it. And so we're going to look at the blessings and the curses uh, at, that are attendant with the covenant and how these can give us hope. So that will be, we'll start in Genesis uh, and we'll look also in Exodus. And um, I hope to see you all then. And I'll be praying for you and uh, hope you have a good week. All right. Thanks, good. Bob. Thanks. Yeah, Thanks. Thank you. Good night. The Basic Training Podcast is led by Dr. Robert Forney. This podcast is available for download on the Apple and Google Podcast apps also for streaming on the Basic Training YouTube channel. If you're interested in contacting us, please email basictrainingpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening.